Okay, welcome back everybody. My name is Chris Christensen. I'm your narrator for the story of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman. This is written by Deloitte John Guth and narrated by yours truly, Chris Christensen. I am the great-great-grandson of Omer Madison Kem, who was a three-term Nebraska populist and congressman. So we're hearing about his story, his trial, his tribulations. And we're now on chapter three of the story. So please like and subscribe and uh, share this with as many people as you can so we can share more and more of the content of Omer Madison Kem. This is the uh, first time this political history has ever been put on the internet and you're going to find out some very interesting things in chapter three titled The Red-Headed Tempest on the Plains. By 1890, Omer Madison Kem had matured both in his personal ideals and in his reaction to agrarian realities. Whereas transition and turbulence had characterized his first 35 years, he had at last become consistent in his own principles. In a word, Omer Kem had arrived. His forceful and dynamic temperament, coupled with a vigorous independence of mind, had catapulted him into a new but well-suited role as a political agitator. Economic realities had provided the impetus and the sustaining factor in the, crusading, in the crusading zeal which had taken hold of Omer Madison Kem, but his reaction had been far more violent than that of the other discontented farmers, simply because he had never shirked the opportunity to take matters into his own hands. He had long ago learned that man must be the master of his own destiny, and though economics and politics had intervened to prevent his mastery, Omer Kem could not stand by in watchful waiting for his world to disintegrate. When he had become aware of the losing battle being fought by agriculture against industrialism, Kem had naturally and vehemently refused to betray his birthright by silent submission. He had had too much pride and self-righteousness to admit defeat and move back east as many other homesteaders had done. When indigence had cornered him in his Saudi, Omer Kem could do nothing but fight back with all of the weapons at his disposal. Hence, he had readily accepted baptism in the political arena in 1889. Omer Madison Kemp's reaction to agrarian ills had stemmed from his own temperament, but his fellow farmers soon showed that they shared his feelings. He consistently captivated his farm audiences by his appearance, background, and words. Short, muscular, dressed in overalls, and endowed with flaming red hair and a handlebar mustache, Kem easily personified action and agrarianism. Whether he spoke as the organizer for the alliance or as a candidate for a political office, his colorful features demanded attention. His most appealing quality, and the only one which counted as far as the western farmers saw it, was the fact that he was one of them. Kem abundantly typified the frontier farmers in a manner which facilitated his fellow's identification with them. The gospel Kem preached catered to the agrarian independence of mind and seemed to indicate a common sense solution to all of the farmers' troubles. His answer lay in the Farmer Alliance, which sought to establish itself as the financial and political agent for the farmers. His venomous outpourings against the Republican Party as the representatives for the exploiters, appealed largely to the general distrust which Western farmers had for the East. Moreover, Omer Madison Kemp's demand for independent political action offered the discontented but proud farmers the opportunity to gain recognition as a unit. As a result, Kem had everything in his favor, and from a strictly economic point of view, he had nothing to lose by giving up his decidedly unsuccessful career as a farmer. Thanks to the amazing successes of himself and the other Custer County independents, Omer Kem had become ambitious to spread further the movement for a new party composed of farmers. On January 7th and 8th of 1890, when the Nebraska Farmers Alliance held its annual meeting at Grand Island, he and the other delegates from Custer County unsuccessfully renewed their efforts to commit the organization to independent political action. Refusing to accept defeat, Kem and his fellows met shortly thereafter at Kearney with S. Edwin Thornton, an influential leader in the state organization, to discuss the possibility of fielding an independent, alliance-supported candidate for Congress for the fall election. 
In March, at Ravenna, Kim joined a group of Alliance men from several of the counties in the 3rd Congressional District, and they issued a call for a Congressional Nominating Convention. Kim, by now, had broadened his political operations to the point where he saw a possibility that the Farmers Alliance might grant outright support of political action. But before an actual nominating convention could be held, the group needed some sort of organization within the district. And here, Kim's ambitions for concerted alliance action began to reach fulfillment. Not all of the loosely connected local alliances could be depended upon for support, at least as long as the state alliance refused to endorse the movement. But this problem reached a compromise solution when, on April 22nd, a meeting in Lincoln of county presidents and organizers of the Farmers Alliance gave tacit consent to the idea. It endorsed the convention for the 3rd District, but emphasized again that this will not be an alliance convention. It would be only a people's independent convention in the highest sense of the term. The state leaders, John Powers and Jay Burroughs, further advised the local alliances in distinctly vague terms to take the most available agency at hand in securing the election of candidates who would represent the farmer. For Omer Madison Kem, tacit consent meant tacit victory for his viewpoint, and in reality, it did represent a decided weakening in the nonpartisan principles of the Nebraska Farmers Alliance. Consequently, on May 29, 1890, Kem went to Grand Island to meet with representatives from the Knights of Labor, the Union Labor Party, and the Farmers Alliance. And this meeting made the final preparations for the Congressional Convention. It would be held on July 15th at Columbus and would represent the Farmers Alliance and other farm and labor groups. The absence from the Grand Island Conference of any representatives from 28 of the 52 counties in the 3rd District indicated, however, that Cam's dream of farmer unity still remained a long way from full realization. But Kim had cause to be increasingly confident for two days after the Grand Island meeting, the Nebraska Grange voted to join efforts being made for a farm party. In the month and a half preceding the convention itself, the local alliances with the newly obtained blessing of the state organization began drumming up support for the impending birth of a new farmer's party. Local newspapers, either of alliance or anti-Republican leanings, provided publicity and many new newspapers sprang up to dramatize the agrarian cause. Indeed, the quote-unquote People's Independent Campaign began long before the party had organized. In addition, the state alliance bent to the pressures exerted by Cam and the other Westerners by openly calling for a state convention of the People's Independent Party. After being confronted with a petition containing over 15,000 signatures collected in four weeks, the Alliance's secretary, James M. Thompson, acquiesced and set July 29th as the date for the meeting to be held in Lincoln. The Nebraska Alliance had finally decided to scrap its nonpartisanship. For Omer Madison Kim, the final political breakthrough had been made. He and other delegates from Broken Bow independently decided to support their local lawyer, the man named Knox, who had aided Kim in his ill-fated 1889 campaign on the Union labor ticket. By July 15th of 1890, the newspapers supporting the Alliance-sponsored convention had already mentioned two other possible candidates. The first was Judge Henry J. Shin of Custer County, whom the Alliance had elected to the bench in 1889, and the other, Charles D. Schrader, was a longtime leader in the state alliance. Omer Kim did not actively seek the nomination, but he had already become well known as an agitator and activist. His union labor campaign, coupled with four years of stump speaking for the Farmers Alliance, had made him popular throughout the Custer County vicinity, and Kim went to the convention two days ahead of time to work with the platform committee and with the avowed intention of campaigning for Knox. 
At this time, as he later recalled, several of the delegates suggested that he be the nominee, but he refused even to consider it. However, by the time the convention opened, popular support had begun to grow for Omer Madison Kem. On July 15th to 17th, 1890, at Columbus, Nebraska, occurred one of the more rustic political meetings which had as yet taken place in the state. With the possible exception of a few men like Omer Madison Kem, the delegates assembled had never before attended any political convention. They represented farmers and laborers from all counties north of the Platte River, with the exception of Douglas and Sarpy counties. This area comprised the 3rd Congressional District, which was so vast that most of the men had never met each other before. They had come from their homesteads and the small towns with a common desire to unite, to unite for the fall election. Political accoutrements advertising several possible nominees had been severely frowned upon since they smacked of what Kim later called old party methods. The only banners allowed were those which denounced the Republican Party and its three-term congressman from that district, George Dorsey. But even though they denounced the trappings of the ancient regime, the organizers of the convention, Kem included, still followed traditional political procedure. Committees were established, and the various reports issued forth, just as in any Republican convention. The one innovation, that of taking all votes by acclamation, might have been intended to further democratic principles, but it could also have provided a method for stampeding the loosely organized delegations. After the adoption of the platform by a voice vote, Delegate Kem stood up, placed Knox's name in nomination for the congressional seat, and then sat down amidst a, quote, profound silence, unquote. Seconds later, he heard his name called out. Immediately, the convention erupted into a mass of whooping, shouting, arm-waving, hat-throwing supporters acting like lunatics, as he later recalled. A motion from the floor asked that the nomination be made unanimous, and the Vox Populi rang out once more for Omer Madison Kemp. The stampede method, as allowed under the acclamation rule, certainly smacked of old party methods, but Omer Madison Kem maintained throughout his life that he had not sought the nomination and that it had come without his knowledge or encouragement. Be that as it may, it did not take Omer Madison Kem long to decide in favor of acceptance. He later noted that it seemed that this was an arranged plan to make it impossible for me to refuse the nomination. Nevertheless, several hours later, Kem delivered a two-hour speech of acceptance. In it, he asked for the wholehearted cooperation of everyone for the campaign, promised to do his best to win the November election, and then launched into a tirade against the Republican Party and its puppet congressman, George W.E. Dorsey. Kem emphasized the fact that he had no money with which to wage the campaign, and particularly made mention of his own $1,550 mortgage. In alliance and labor circles, Kem was accepted with open arms for his speech had given them exactly the gospel which they wanted preached. As for the Republicans, they replied with the sneers and an ad hominem attack upon the new party's candidate. The Republican Fremont Tribune challenged the wisdom of placing legislation in the quotes of in the hands, quote unquote, of paupers, but such words only provided another rallying point for the farmers who also looked upon themselves as paupers, thanks to the Republican Party. So the word itself became a real issue during the ensuing campaign, thanks to the newspapers which supported Kim. Undoubtedly, the most lasting contribution in this regard came from the pen of A.L. Uh, Doc Bixby, a staunch Republican journalist from Lincoln who coined a ditty which shortly attracted national attention. Upon hearing Kim's acceptance speech, he wrote, 
I cannot sing the old songs, my heart is full of woe, but I can howl calamity from a hell to broken bow. Kim later added the term calamity howler to his own repertoire, using it frequently in his speeches both at home and in the nation's capital. For the Republicans, it was a handy label of derision, but for Omer Madison Kim, it signified the fact that he had the courage to face the economic realities of the day. Obtaining the, the nomination of a totally new and inexperienced political party was one thing, but winning the election to Congress would be quite another. Omar Kem faced a difficult task. He was so little known outside the immediate vicinity of Broken Bow that the newspapers consistently misspelled his name during the early stages of his campaign. Yet, he had in his favor his own determination the enthusiasm of the discontented farmers, and most important of all, the conversion of the entire Farmers Alliance machinery into the People's Independent Party. On July 29th at the Alliance Convention at Lincoln, Kim worked his arms like pump handles, according to a sympathetic journalist, in an attempt to garner public recognition and support for his candidacy. He won state endorsement, as well as the adoption of a general platform which supplemented the Columbus resolutions. Thus, he now had a solid basis for his impending campaign. In addition, S. Edwin Thornton, the man who had given the original support to Kim and Custer County in their fight for an alliance-supported congressional convention, accepted the responsibility for managing Kim's campaign in the 3rd District. So, in three busy months... The entire Alliance network of organization had become that of the People's Independent Movement. Kim's candidacy had been instrumental in shifting the Alliance from nonpartisanship, and he could now benefit from the support of the far-flung machinery. Moreover, Omer Madison Kim received from the Alliance Convention at Lincoln a platform upon which he would long stand. The Lincoln platform reflected the agrarian spirit of democracy, and was a total endorsement of the theory of a Republican plot against Western agriculture. In regard to the latter, the platform on which Kim would make his campaign demanded the free coinage of silver and government issue of paper money, the abolition of the land monopoly, federal control of the means of transportation and communication, and reform of the tax system. Since Kem had consistently cried out against the agents of spoilization and robbery for the past three years, such a platform merely reinforced his own approach to the problem. The money question especially became a personal fetish for him. Kem maintained that the Republicans purposely held the supply of money down, thereby enabling the money loaner and manufacturer to manipulate the money market to their own benefit, but at the cost of the farmer and laborer. In actuality, the per capita amount of money had decreased steadily, while the nation's population had grown by leaps and bounds. Kem maintained that this plot against the commoner had been knowingly arranged so that the farmer could not afford the necessities of life or pay off his debts. What Kem wanted was an inflated currency, and his conviction on this point grew concomitantly with the increasing emphasis placed by his party on the issue of the free coinage of silver. In addition, Cam's attention centered around several other political and economic reforms. Besides the People's Party pledge to secure the Australian ballot system, the eight-hour day for all non-farming laborers, and an increase in pensions for Civil War veterans, Cam spoke out in 1890 for the adoption of the initiative, recall, and referendum. One thing for which he did not campaign and which he never publicly endorsed throughout his political career was prohibition. The People's Party had refused to take a stand on that question, believing that the opposition might use prohibition to confuse and cloud the more basic issues. Even though Kim and many other independents personally believed in prohibition, he would not allow it to become an issue in his campaigns. His contact with the prohibition party had taught him that the question was a political liability which he could not afford. But in general, Kim and the People's Party offered by their platform something to placate every major class of malcontents. And in this, 
he and the other members of the party proved that they could play the game of politics as well as their Republican opponents. The major emphasis maintained throughout the campaign remained on agrarian issues since the alliance overshadowed the other groups once it swung into the thick of politics. The Farmers Alliance had become the People's Party, and that was the way candidate Kemp had wanted it from the outset of his career as an agitator. On August 8, 1890, Omer Madison Kemp opened his canvas of the 3rd District in the town of Atkinson in Holt County. Having leased his homestead on shares at the time of his move to Broken Bow, he did not have to worry about any interference from farm work. But for that matter, none of the other western farmers had cause to worry about harvesting their crops. The 10-year drought resumed after its recess in 1889, devastating the farm crops and aiding Kim's Kem's campaign. For 20 days during the month of July, the temperatures reached above 100 degrees. This, coupled with agricultural prices which continued their decline, literally drove the Westerners into Kem's waiting arms. In lieu of raising crops, Kem offered the farmers the next best thing. In the words of the Kansan Mrs. Mary Elizabeth Lees, the chance to raise more hell. And this they did under the stimulation of the two-hour diatribes of their fellow farmer, Omer Madison Kem. At Atkinson, he shared the platform with John Powers, the president of the Nebraska Alliance and the People's Party candidate for governor. From this point on, however, Kem struck out by himself and only shared his platform occasionally with the other candidates on the People's Independent ticket. With few railroads available to take him into the 52 counties of his district, Kem did most of his traveling by horse and wagon. Even if he could have campaigned completely, completely by rail, he certainly would not have received the free passes bestowed lavishly on the incumbent Republicans. The funds for the campaign depended mainly upon the many alliances scattered throughout the Big Third. In addition, Kem, and did, Kem could and did pass the hat after each rally his opponents correctly called him a pauper because he hardly had a cent to his name he made sure that the family in broken bow had enough to live on thanks to the rent received from the homestead but this was his only source of income on august 1st kem had resigned from his position as deputy county treasurer thus eliminating that salary later he would often recall he wondered if any man has the moral right to take the financial risk that he did. The fact that his own economic survival was at stake complemented the plight of the farmer in inducing Kem to put more zeal and dedication into his campaign. Kem campaigned in a different town each day from August 8th through November 3rd. The day before the election, the only exception he allowed came midway in his travels when he took a three-day vacation to visit with his family. His campaign manager and secretary, S. Edwin Thornton, set up daily schedules for two weeks in advance, and Kem never missed any of those appointed rallies. On several occasions, especially in particularly isolated western farm areas, he held the rallies in an open field. In all cases, he went wherever he could get a farm or working class audience, and this meant that his meetings almost always carried the sponsorship of the local Farmers Alliance. The size of his job was as big as the 3rd Congressional District. The territory comprised the whole of Nebraska north of the Platte River, with the exceptions of Douglas and Sarpy counties, and also included Perkins County south of the river. But with the Farmer Alliance machinery at his disposal, Kem's main concern was whether his team of horses could stand the strain of daily moving. He himself never worried about the grueling pace which took him from one end of the state to the other. <clears throat> Once the Claude Hopper, or Hayseed as his Republican opponents derisively called him, entered a town in his farm wagon, the cheers and banners went up. 
The farmers would parade through the town in their wagons and then retire to the center of town where Ken would address them from his wagon. In some cases, as on October 10th at Fullerton, his zealous supporters would build a miniature sod house on the platform to emphasize Kem's common bond with the homesteaders. The crowds varied in number, with favorable estimates ranging as high as 3,000 for the rally on September 1st in heavily rural Boone County. The local farmers' alliances usually arranged an outdoor barbecue for the farmers, and a roast ox on a spit ordinarily filled the bill. In all cases, Kim asked for the faith of the farmers and guaranteed that he would do all in his power to fight the trusts and moneyed interests which had figuratively placed the Westerners in captivity. With red hair waving and puddles of perspiration pouring from his brow, Kim stood with clenched fist and a beckoning hand. He spoke in proud terms of having chased a corn cultivator all his life and feverishly waved his own $1,550 mortgage to show the fruits of his labors. Kim demanded reform, reform of the money and taxation system so as to remove the burden from the commoners, reform of the railroads by placing them under federal regulation, thereby eliminating the vultures who preyed on the farmer through exorbitant freight rates, reform of the government by taking control of it away from the special interests and restoring it to the hands of the plain people, reform of the land system to eliminate the eastern speculators and mortgage companies who exploited the natural, natural misfortunes of the farmer, and reform of the tariff so as to destroy the false and costly price structures erected against the farmer and for the industrial interests. To this, the Alliance members and the laborers answered, Amen, Brother Kim. Omer Madison Kim certainly received aid and encouragement from all sides, even unintentionally from the Republicans. The incumbent Republican, Congressman George Dorsey, was an influential party politician, being the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee at the time. In the eyes of Kim and the farmers, this was proof positive that Dorsey was a tool of Wall Street. Also, because of his opponent's position in Congress, Kim easily labeled Dorsey as the man responsible for the enactment of the tariff and money laws which Kim contended had brought economic chaos to the farmers. With special regard to the tariff issue, Kim received the aid of a vigorous publicity campaign waged against the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Late in the campaign, Dorsey drew a charge that he had wired Matthew Quay, the Republican national chairman, for help against the revolt personified by Kim. The wire purportedly read, have the manufacturers quote lower prices and deny that the McKinley bill raises prices. If this is not done, it will cost thousands of votes in Nebraska. Since the McKinley tariff of 1890 had just raised tariff rates to new highs, candidate Kim had plenty of ammunition to fire at Congressman Dorsey. Whether or not the telegram had been sent could never be proved, but the anti-Dorsey segment of the press treated it as an accepted fact. Moreover, Dorsey became embroiled in a bitter intra-party struggle for power with the Republican candidate for governor, Lucius Richards, and Omer Kim again benefited from the opposition forces. Every non-Republican newspaper in the state made Dorsey fair game for personal attacks, stating that his white slave recipients of patronage had saved the day for him in his squabble with Richards. Then the fact that Dorsey owned a bank in Ponca did little to help his cause. Several pro-chem newspapers stated that Dorsey had admittedly taken nearly $60,000 from his bank for the campaign. In addition, the anti-Republicans bandied the rather inane term Dorseyism until it became a household expression among the farmers. No one knew exactly what it meant, except that it signified the evil and corruption of the Republican plot as personified by Dorsey. In most cases, these attacks simply replied, 
in kind to the Republican sneers, but at any rate, the free exchange made for a colorful, if not mudslinging, campaign. Words were as cheap as corn in 1890, and Omer Medicine Kim cashed in on the former since the farmers could not cash in on the latter. While Kim's main opposition came from the Republicans, he faced other obstacles on his wagon ride to the banks of the Potomac. Although the Democrats had been weak in Nebraska since the Civil War, they had high hopes of slipping to victory between the Republicans and the People's Party. The Democrat Omaha World Herald openly cheered the fact that Kem represented a large block of ex-Republicans, and although sympathetic to Kem in the interim before the Democratic Convention in August, it really hoped that this leakage from the Republican ranks would be enough to bring victory for its party nominee, William Thompson. Kem had not actually sought an endorsement from the Democrats, but he had received 86 votes in that party's convention. So, he faced a Republican incumbent, a Democrat, and a Prohibition candidate, William L. Pierce. With a field of four candidates, Kem's campaign inexorably demanded daily and tireless pump speaking, or stump speaking, in every corner of the Big Third. That 1890 would not repeat the traditional Republican sweep in Nebraska grew evident as the campaign waxed hot through the cool months of autumn. True, the state had since its inception elected only one non-Republican to the House and none to the Senate, and three-term Congressman Dorsey had always enjoyed a 6 to 11,000 vote majority. Each election had increased the majority for Dorsey and had further strengthened Republican and railroad control of Nebraska politics. But when the Cam brand of fire and brimstone oratory hit the Big Third in 1890, what originally appeared to be a tempest in a teapot became a full-blown political hurricane. Even though Kim faced three opponents and also possessed little political experience, he soon held a distinct advantage over the other candidates. He had a sizable anti-Dorsey element working in his interests, even though it need not have been pro-Kim. In this sense, the campaign's extremely negative aura worked to Kim's advantage, for it created a void which he could easily fill. The alliance machinery plus the drought and low farm prices soon gave him positive support with nearly 100 alliance newspapers beating the chem drum and more than 1,500 local alliance groups. The people's candidate had a decisive advantage. Most important, chem was from the farm and possessed a mortgage and this he would never let his rural audience forget. All in all, 1890 just was not a year for Republican victory. While Kim had the political situation well in hand, he did face one minor revolt in his home county. A small alliance group in Custer County, mem numbering five members, bitterly waged a short attack on Kim in the closing days of the campaign. But since it was only one group out of the 88 organized in the county, Kim had little cause to worry. The quarrel stemmed from what the Alliance Press called a private grievance, the exact nature of which never became clear and was as was to be expected, the Republican press leaped at the opportunity to discredit Kim. The Kim supporters immediately expelled the five ex-Republicans from the Custer County Alliance Network. Not before voices had tarnished the glittering shield of farm unity previously presented in Kim's backyard. On November 1st, Omer Madison Kemp wearily finished his final rally with a rousing speech in Broken Bow. The Republican press wishfully claimed that Dorsey gained strength through this meeting, but the time for facades of strength had long since passed. Kim spent the next two days at informal get-togethers in his home county. Then, after casting his ballot, Kem retired to Lincoln on the 4th to await the official election returns. Here he first met his youthful counterpart, William Jennings Bryan, the Democrat populist candidate from the 1st Congressional District. The Democrats and populists, as the press had dubbed the People's Party, awaited the expected demise of the Republicans. Their joint celebration over the corpse of the Republican devil would not be long in coming. While Kem took an early but slim lead over his three opponents, the election in the Big Third hung in the balance for a week. 
But with all of the votes tabulated, Omer Madison Kim and People's Party and the People's Party accepted the farmer's wreath of victory. He received 31,831 votes, while his closest opponent, the incumbent Republican Dorsey, gathered 25,440. The third place went to the Democrats and their nominee, Thompson, with 22,353, while the Prohibition Party amassed a grand total of 961 votes. In his successful bid for Congress, Kem captured 28 of the 52 counties. His greatest victories came in the counties surrounding and including Custer, for this was the area where most of the homesteading had been centered. At the same time, he showed an ability to obtain a margin of victory in several counties on the eastern and western borders of Nebraska. In the counties which remained Republican, Kem's defeat was usually by only a slim plurality. This was especially true for every county west of Custer. Not only did he capture heavily rural areas, but he also emerged victorious in those counties in the Big Third, containing most of the western towns. Hence, Kem's victory sounded the death knell for the Republicans and produced what they themselves called a political revolution. The thunderbolt with red hair had struck, leaving farmer unity and political chaos in his wake. In general, Kem's dramatic victory had represented a total rejection of the special interests against which he had so ardently campaigned. But in reality, it had also meant the uprising of a new special interest group, the farmers. Long left on the fringes of growing economic wealth, they had risen in revolt to demand a greater share of the nation's prosperity. While Kem had viciously attacked the moneyed interests, his campaign had positively represented a cry for the agrarian interests. And in so doing, Kem had fostered a consensus of agrarian opinion which placed extreme emphasis on the have-nots and their struggle for economic and political redemption. The end result had been an emotionally charged class struggle which had been as much fostered by Republicans charges of pauper candidates as it had been by Kem's pleas to the discontented farmers. The campaign of 1890 had been waged with an almost religious-like zeal and had been directed toward real economic problems which grew in the wake of rising industrialism. In the process, Omer Madison Kem had been successful in tying his personal ambitions to the rampant discontent. The wedding had produced a professional farmer's advocate possessed of the opportunity to carry the agrarian crusade into the hallowed halls of Congress. By his election to Congress, Kem had secured for himself a new lease on life. As he later admitted, I was greatly relieved in a financial sense, for I had taken desperate chances that would have ruined me had I failed. Instead of abject poverty, his victory had secured to him an annual income of $5,000 plus travel and stationary expenses. Moreover, his election had won for him and for his agrarian crusade and had thereby confirmed his faith in the righteousness of his cause. He had fulfilled his promise to the nominating convention by doing his best to be elected for, as a matter of fact, he had accomplished the nearly impossible by cracking the two-party system wide open in his first attempt. Now, Omer Kem had another and much bigger and more difficult promise to fulfill for all of the farmers in the third district. Because of his election to Congress, he would now have to take the battle into the very stronghold of the enemy. And that is the end of chapter three of the story of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman. Again, there is Omer Madison Kem, my great great grandfather. Here's the title page for the book, written by Deloitte John Guth. It was actually a master's thesis, and we're hearing the story of how he was elected to Congress. So, wow, what an amazing campaign story and a lot of hard work traveling and just canvassing the area so he worked hard to get those votes and in the end it worked out
So thank you for joining today for chapter three. We're going to move over to another video for chapter four of the People's Congressman, the story of Omer Madison Kem. And the title of chapter four will be The Farmer's Advocate Goes to Washington. So he's been elected. Now he's going to Washington, and we're going to hear the story of how the populists affected change in Washington, D.C. So come back for chapter four. It just keeps getting better and better. I'm your narrator, Chris Christensen. I'm the great-great-grandson of Omer Madison Kem, and these are his archives as written by uh, Deloitte John Guth. Thank you, uh, Professor Guth, um, for writing the story of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman. So please come back for Chapter 4, and we're going to read that in another YouTube video. So again, please like and subscribe, and go check out the next video.